Hi, I'm Brian Finley, Artistic Director of the West Bend Centre for Connection and Creativity Through Music. Welcome to Music for a While, a podcast that takes you behind the scenes of the wonderful world of music. Today, Mozart, with our sunny expert, Barb Hobart. But first, back to the very beginning. Mozart, age six, and his very first published composition, the Minuet in G, Kerschel, one. Good morning, Barb. Good morning, Brian. (laughs) How are you doing this sunny day today? (laughs) I'm fine. Self-isolating as I am. (laughs) Oh, good for you, as am I. But we have a really sunny topic to talk about today, which is is really fun. I just met, uh, I've just heard about this amazing nine-year-old, and I wanted to uh, uh, share with you some some incredible stuff about this new musician who's uh, who's just been reported through the, the Royal Society in London, no less by some scholar called Danes Barrington. Uh, And this Danes Barrington visited this nine-year-old person in London and put him through several tests. And he offered his conclusions to the Royal Society in London, who have published them in their Philosophical Transactions of 1770. Okay, I'm a little behind my time, but anyway, there it is. But here's uh, here's what they said about this, this young person. Suppose then, suggested Barrington in attempting to describe this person's sight-reading abilities, a capital speech in Shakespeare, never seen before, and yet read by a child of eight years old, with all the pathetic energy of a Garrick. Let it be conceived likewise that the same child is reading, with a glance of his eye, three different comments on this speech, tending to its illustration, and that one comment is written in Greek, the second in Hebrew, and the third in Etruscan characters. When all this is conceived, it will convey some idea of what this boy, Mozart, was capable of. Have you ever heard of this Mozart fellow? I have. <laughs> well, what have you heard about him? Well, interestingly <laughs> enough, two things. One was his memory was prodigious, and there is the wonderful story about when he was in the Vatican. The Vatican had this Allegri's Miserere, which was never, uh, they never allowed the music out of its sight. He heard it twice and wrote it down perfectly. And so the Pope was so impressed, he made him a chevalier, which... Mozart was very proud of and sometimes in his letters called himself the Chevalier Mozart. But the other thing that I love is this is what Jan Swofford Swofford says. For nearly two centuries the story has been told and retold. Mozart, the divine mystery, the incomparable freak of nature embodied in an impish and vulgar child who wrote masterpieces before he was 10 but was perpetually misunderstood who was hounded by neglect to a pauper's grave. It is one of the most tragic and moving series in the history of music, but almost none of it is true. 
So, oh my. <laughs> <laughs> certainly Mozart was a prodigy equal to any, writing his first symphonies at eight, his first opera at twelve. Yet Schubert and Mendelssohn produced more original and important work in their teens than Mozart did. In contrast to Schubert, Mozart matured slowly and worked painstakingly, however quickly. Most of his greatest work comes from his last ten years. Moreover, during that decade, he was as respected as any composer alive and paid accordingly, earning more than Haydn did for most of his career. Often he received twice the going rate for writing an opera. He ran out of money sometimes, as many successful people do, from a combination of bad management and bad luck. The begging letters he wrote to friends in later years are certainly pathetic, but by the time he died, he had gone far towards paying his debts back and was on the verge in his mid-30s of real prosperity. Well, that's amazing. That's an incredible quote. It's, uh, it's so interesting to think of Mozart actually developing his style through his through his lifetime. One tends to think that he was magnificent from the word go and that every single thing he wrote is absolutely a, a stroke of genius. Uh, it, it's a pretty good uh, balance, I must say. But uh, <laughs> but but what were like? How where did this come from? Where were the what were the early years like? What, what how did he grow up well, to, it, to become like this? His father was a, a musician and a teacher, and apparently wrote some uh, treatise on how to play the violin, which was spread throughout Europe and, and known for this book. But he was teaching his daughter Nano to play the piano, and in Wolfgang apparently started to copy her and he suddenly realized that other than the daughter he had this wizard on his hands and he saw an opportunity and he took it. <laughs> so he took this child all across Europe, took him to England. Um, it, it's estimated that during his lifetime Wolfgang spent four of his 35 years in a stagecoach. In other words, oh he was a showbiz kid. His life was one of traveling. And his father's advertisements for the show were quite interesting. This is what he wrote. He will play a concerto for the violin and will accompany symphonies on the harpsichord, the keyboard being covered with a cloth. He will instantly name all notes played at a distance. He will finally improvise as long as may be desired and in any key. That's amazing. But he wasn't the only musical one in his family either, was he? No, his sister was very musical as well. And, and that's an older sister, right? Nanro, yes. who we're talking about? Right. Yes, and actually later on in life, um, he would have his music that he wrote copied and sent to his father who would then pass it on to Nanro and she would play it in places and in her own home. And as a, as a youngster too, she used to tour with Wolfgang. Yes. Uh, and the two of them would go around impressing everybody. Uh, what what sort of, where would they play? What, what kind of places? Were... <laughs> well, they played in London, but they also played for the Empress Maria Theresa in Vienna. And that was really... Uh, that's a pretty good game. It was indeed. <laughs> she was an interesting woman, you know, because the Prussians were winning the war against her. There was administrative chaos and her treasury was nearly bankrupt. Her son and heir called their position terrifying, but she was one smart woman. And she allowed the children to play together. Wolfgang jumped up, sorry, jumped up on her lap and kissed her, <laughs> then fell on the floor and was picked up by Marie Antoinette, who was about a year older than him. And she, he apparently said to her, I'm going to marry you when I get older. <laughs> but another, well, that could have been a wrong turn. It could have been. But another thing that kind of, I found interesting because one of the complaints that was made against him was that he was arrogant. But as a child, there was a very distinguished composer who was in Maria Theresa's court. And when he was, when Mozart was asked to play, he turned to this composer and said, turn the pages for me. <laughs> and this composer who named a Wagenzile once wrote Poisonous Child. <laughs> oh, dear. But he played with the children, apparently, in the afternoon. And afterwards, Maria Theresa sent him one of their cast-off coats. It was lilac and gold, and it would have been very expensive to, to buy. And Mozart wore it whenever he performed. But she also sent Leopold 100 ducats, which was the equivalent of about 14 and a half months' salary. Oh, that's the way to be. It was. And they traveled all over the place. 
Now, they had royal um, performances somewhere else, um, and <laughs> they got a lot of money. So Leopold bought a four-seater coach so that they wouldn't have to depend on other people. But apparently it developed all kinds of problems and turned out to be less effective than they thought. Right. As owning your own car usually is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And at one point they went to Italy, and I love it because this is so typical of a child, right? Mozart wrote to his mother that he loved this because the coach driver went as fast as he possibly could. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, let's talk a little bit more about his mother because she's often overshadowed by Leopold the Great, <laughs> the, this huge imposing father that uh, that guided his son and, and taught him and and promoted him and, and showed him to the whole world and bragged over him and so on. But who was the mother behind the scenes? Well, his mother was also very important because, I mean, Leopold was employed by someone else. And there came a point when his employer didn't particularly like the fact that he was traveling all around the country. And so that duty at one point became Mozart's mother. Um, when his, his father actually ordered Mozart to France, Mozart took it as a form of banishment and his... <laughs> His immediate reaction was a thorough dislike for everything French. He was also not very skilled in the political intrigues of the capital and the world of courtly politics. And apparently at that time in Paris, there was this big argument going on about who was the best opera uh, composer. And so Mozart tended to get kind of overlooked. But a friend also described him as too trusting, said he was too inactive, too easy to catch, and too little intent on the means that may lead to fortune. To make an impression in Paris, one has to be artful, enterprising, and daring. To make his fortune, I wish he had half his talent, uh, had but half his talent and twice as much shrewdness. Wow. Well, I guess he relied on his father for his shrewdness. He did. Well, for the first part, anyway. But there were other challenges in Paris. I mean, I, I, I know that he found the pianos difficult to play, and he found it cold, and he found it very uncomfortable, but his mother wasn't well either. No, his mother spoke no French, and she felt very, very isolated. She wrote to Leopold, and this is, these are her words, As far as my life is concerned, it is not very pleasant. All day I sit in my room as if it were a prison cell. The room is dark and faces a little courtyard where you can't see the sun all day and one doesn't know what the weather is like. There's just enough light coming through the window that if I try very hard, I can do a little knitting. We have to pay 30 livres a month for this room. The entrance and staircase are so narrow that it is not possible to bring a clavier up to our room. Wolfgang has to do his composing at the home of Monjou Le Gros. I don't see him all day, and I may well forget how to talk. Huh, some people might wish that about me. <laughs> <laughs> not me. <laughs> <laughs> Things got better when they found rooms not far from the Paris Opera House. Then Maria Anna could go for walks along the boulevards. But three months later, in a letter, she wrote, After lunch, I went walking in the Luxembourg Garden. Afterwards, I looked at the beautiful pictures in the palace, but when I got home, I felt strangely tired. And of course, his, um, she had this bad throat and ear problems, and she wished to return home, but Leopold wrote in a letter that they should stay in Paris and she should recover there. But then she began to suffer from chills and a fever. She was bled, but to no avail. Uh, Mozart decided he should hide the truth of her condition from his father, printing a grim picture, but not giving him all the facts straight away. So on, from Paris on July 3rd, 1778, Mozart wrote to a friend, Joseph Bullinger, in Salzburg. It was written on the night of his mother's death. It has an extraordinary poignancy which was deepened by the simplicity of his language. He wrote, 
my very dear friend, for you alone. Mourn with me, my friend. This was the saddest day of my life. I am writing at two o'clock in the morning, and I must tell you that my mother, my dear mother, is no more. God has called her to himself. It was his will to take her. I can see it clearly. Therefore, I have resigned myself to God's will. He gave her to me. He could also take her from me. Just imagine all the turmoil, the anxiety, and worries that I endured these last two weeks. She died without regaining consciousness. She went out like a light. Three days earlier, she had made her last confession and received extreme unction. But the last three days, she was delirious throughout. And today, at 21 minutes after five o'clock, her breathing became compulsive. She lost her senses and perception. I pressed her hand, spoke to her, but she did not see me and did not hear me. She felt nothing anymore. Now I'm going to skip ahead a bit and say, at this time, I am asking you for only one service as a friend, and that is to prepare my dear father very gently for this sad news. I have written him today as well, but only that she is gravely ill. Now I am waiting for an answer so I can be guided by it. May God give him strength and courage. And then, six days later, he wrote to his father, Bonjour, mon très cher père. I hope you are now ready to receive this saddest and most painful news with fortitude. My last letter to you from the third of the month will have prepared you to expect the worst. That very same day, on the third, at 22 minutes after 10 o'clock at night, my mother passed on peacefully to the Lord. When I wrote to you, she was already partaking of the heavenly joys. It was all over by then. I wrote to you late that night, and I hope that you and my dear sister will forgive me for this small but necessary deception. When I thought about my own pain and sadness in relation to how it might affect you, I simply could not bring myself to overwhelm you with this distressing news. You can easily imagine what I went through, what courage and fortitude I needed to endure it all with composure when things got increasingly stressful and difficult. And yet God in his mercy bestowed on me the grace I needed I felt such terrible pain, cried and cried, but to what avail? I had no choice but to console myself, and I beg you, dear father and sister, to do the same. the summer of 1781, two women, one real, one fictional, vied for Mozart's attention. <laughs> Constanza with a C was the younger sister of Mozart's first love. Aloysia, I believe that was how you would say it. She was a, a, a great singer and he really fell in love with her, but she was having none of it. Um, oh, it's so easy to have. <laughs> And Constanza with the C lived with her overbearing and God-fearing mother on the third floor of a home in Vienna. The other was Constanza with a K, who was the heroine of his new opera, The Abduction from the Seraglio. And the opera premiered July 1782, and Mozart and Constanza were married in August of the same year. And again, the movie Amadeus does Constanza no favor. She comes across as <laughs> scatterbrained. But in truth, she came from a family of talented musicians. Her father was a singer, a prompter, a copyist, and a voice teacher. Three of his daughters, his four daughters, were quite remarkable singers. The first queen of the night in his magic flute was Constanza's sister, Josepha, and her other sister, as I say, Aloysia, was a very popular diva in her day. Constanza grew up speaking Italian and French, as well as her native German. In a carefully written letter to his father, Mozart wrote, 
I must make you better acquainted with the character of my dear Constanza. Her whole beauty consists in two little black eyes. I'm not, I'm not sure. That... <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe that's a translation, Barb. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> maybe dark eyes is a maybe better Maybe dark <laughs> eyes and a pretty figure. She likes to be neatly and cleanly dressed, but not smartly. You know, uh, Leopold was really tight with the money, right? <laughs> so I think Mozart was trying to reassure him. Oh, that she wasn't extravagant. That she wasn't extravagant. Yeah, of course. Of course. And most things that a woman needs, she is able to make for herself. So she's self-sufficient. Ha. Huh. And she dresses her own hair every day. I don't know why that's something to be proud of, but apparently it is. <laughs> it's, he said, I love her and she loves me with all her heart. Tell me whether I could wish for a better wife. Well, now that's an interesting question because... Uh, I'm not sure Leopold was too crazy about his son getting married in the first place no, at all to anybody. No, he wasn't. And But he wrote that to, uh, to Mozart, sort of saying, you know, I don't think this is a good idea. But then the reason for the marriage comes through, because on July of that year, he wrote his father. And I love, when he's about to deliver some bad news, he gets quite... <laughs> um, uh, what's the word I want, over the top when he addresses his father because he says, <laughs> dearest and best of all fathers. <laughs> oh, dear, yes, here we go. <laughs> I must implore you, implore you for all you hold dear in the world. Please give me your consent so that I may marry my dear Constanza. Don't think it is only for the sake of getting married. If it were for that reason alone, I'd be glad to wait a little longer. However... I feel that it is absolutely necessary on account of my honor as well as that of my girl, but also on account of my health and peace of mind. My Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> my heart is in turmoil, my head confused. How can one think I can work intelligently under such circumstances? And where does it all come from? Most people believe, Father, we are married already. Her mother gets upset about such talk. And the poor girl is being tormented to death. And so am I. All this can be remedied quite easily. I am writing eagerly for your consent, my beloved father. I am sure you will give it to me. My honor and peace of mind depend upon it. Yeah, let me go back to honor. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what was the what was the happy outcome of that? Well, apparently her mother was really super religious. And I guess, to put this in a nice way, they were spending rather a lot of time together. I see. <laughs> and she was not always at home at night, shall we put it that way? <laughs> and what about Leopold's response to this? Well, Did he say, well, sure, why not? It, Leopold still wasn't very happy about it, but actually the marriage took place before his consent arrived. I think he realized that there was nothing he could do about it. Um, and also, I think saying uh, sort of the underlying reasons for it would have, in that day and age, made Leopold give his consent, especially when Mozart said that he couldn't work intelligently under such circumstances, <laughs> because Leopold's livelihood sort of depended on Mozart's in many ways. about livelihood. Mozart, uh, of course, became a professional musician himself, meaning that uh, as he matured, he was responsible for creating music that he could sell or creating musical experiences that he could sell and get money. So he started, uh, he started to do um, subscription series where he would sell a subscription of a certain number of concerts and then write the music for the concerts and then perform the concerts. And, and hopefully continue that on. So how, um, how did he do? So like musicians today even, I mean, his earnings were up and down. There were times when he was flush and they would go to a bigger apartment with better furnishings. And part of the problem was while he made a lot of money, 
he spent a lot of money. Um, Probably slightly more than he made. Uh, yes, because <laughs> if he's like most people, <laughs> he could command up to six thousand dollars for one of his performances. Um, and so, as I say, the other thing was that Constanza was often in bad health, especially after they. I mean, they uh, lost a lot of children, and she would get. I guess what we would call today probably postpartum depression. And they would go to these very expensive spas. And later in his career, there are some really pathetic letters that he wrote to friends seeking to to borrow money because he was in such bad straits. But as I said earlier, that Jan Swafford said that in that last year of his life, he was actually paying back those de debts and making a lot of money but unfortunately then his ill health kicked in and he wasn't able to do the writing but he he did as I say earn a lot of money in his lifetime but as you mentioned he also spent a lot <laughs> he loved parties he loved entertaining I mean there was that childish aspect to him where he kind of never grew out of it actually and another interesting thing is... Those people who love life so much, what is it with them? Well, he did. And the other thing that's kind of interesting, because we haven't talked about this, but he had this whole thing about bathroom humor. I mean, it, it's in... <laughs> it, it sounds like British TV. <laughs> it's in a lot of his letters. Like, uh, it, uh, this sounds bizarre, but he, he used to write frequently about farting, for heaven's sakes. Wow. <laughs> and you wonder kind of why, but as I say, I think that was... Well, maybe you write about what you know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was kind of that childlike aspect. To well, him. you know, it's very interesting because even with such a base kind of wit, uh, he had amazing contemporaries that respected him enormously. He, uh, oh, he did. Haydn and Salieri and... Can you talk a little bit about some of the relationships that he had there? Well, Haydn once said to someone that Mozart was the greatest composer sort of living. Um, he, he thought that he was just... And when I think I mentioned in the Haydn program that after he heard Mozart's operas, Haydn said, I'm never going to write another opera. <laughs> right, but yeah. Haydn also influenced Mozart because it was Haydn's string quartets that prompted Mozart to write his, and he wrote his, dedicated his six string quartets to Joseph Haydn, and this is what he wrote to him in 1785. To my dear friend Haydn, a father, having decided to send his children out into the wide world, felt that he should entrust them to the protection and guidance of a famous man who by good fortune also was his best friend. Here they are, distinguished man and dearest friend, my six children. They are, to be truthful, the fruit of long and laborious efforts. However, the hope given to me by various friends that my efforts will be at least somewhat rewarded encourages and flatters me to think that this offspring will be of comfort to me some day. You yourself, dearest friend, told me of your approbation of them during your last visit here in our capital. This acceptance gives me the courage to commend them to you and makes me hope that they would not be completely unworthy of your favor. May it please you to welcome them kindly and to be for them a father, guide, and friend. From this moment on, I hand over to you all my rights in them, begging you, however, to consider with indulgence their flaws, which a father's uncritical eye may have overlooked, and in spite of them, Continue your generous, generous friendship toward one who so greatly appreciates it. While I remain, dearest friend, with all my heart, your most sincere friend. Well, that is quite a letter. Uh, and, it's, and one has to remind oneself that you're talking, Mozart is talking about string quartets. He's not talking about actual children. He's talking about... Uh, his art, even so, and he acknowledged he acknowledged that there were f flaws in these string quartets, uh, but he was quite critical of himself at other times as he well. He was, too. but he he was he was. People forget, you know, that he had great intellectual acumen, and he really was um, a good observer of other people's music. Like there's a letter he wrote to his father in 1784, and it said, "We have the famous." Strinacci, I don't know how you pronounce this person's name, from Mantua here right now. She is a very good violinist, has excellent taste, 
and a lot of feeling in her playing. I am composing a sonata for her that we will be performing together on Thursday in her concert at the theater. I'm also sending you some quartets by a certain Playel. Have, these have just been published. He is a pupil of Joseph Haydn. If you don't know them, Father, try to get a hold of them. You will find them worth your while. They are very well composed and most pleasant to listen to. You'll hear at once who the teacher is. So before we get to Salieri, if I can mention another one, I love this. He wrote to his father from Mannheim, and it said, Today I will be brief, because I am out of writing paper. <laughs> <laughs> the constraints, right? Right. Yesterday, Wednesday the 19th, the gala celebrations got underway again. I attended a service. The mass was brand new, composed by Vogler. I had already been to the rehearsal the day before yesterday in the afternoon, but I left right after the Kyrie. I have never heard anything like this in my life. Sometimes it doesn't even sound right. He attacks the music in such a way that one must fear that he wants to drag you into it by your hair. <laughs> it's, it's all so clumsy. I don't even want to talk about the execution of, a, of his ideas. Briefly, for a moment, I hear an idea that is not all bad. Well, it doesn't stay not all bad for long. It quickly becomes beautiful. God forbid. It becomes bad and indeed dreadfully bad. Oh, my. Well, at least he's honest about it, I suppose. And... But then to the Salieri thing. But he wrote to his dad in Vienna, from Vienna, on July 2nd, 1783. And it says, Mon très cher père, last post my mind was filled with so many things that I simply forgot to write to you. So he was talking about um, writing an opera, I believe, and he said, so I sent a message to Count Rosenberg to the effect that I won't give my aria to anyone unless the following text will be printed in the libretto in both German and Italian. So he was writing something for a, a specific singer. And it says, the text was printed into the booklet, and I let them have the areas that brought me and my sister-in-law the greatest honor. My enemies were quite confounded. Now, I have to tell you of a trick. Herr Salieri played that, however, did more harm to poor Adamberger than to me. I think I told you already that I composed a rondo for Adamberger as well. At a short rehearsal earlier, when the rondo hadn't even been copied yet, Salieri motioned Adamberger aside and said to him that Count Rosenberg would not particularly like it if he added an extra aria, and therefore, as a good friend, he would advise him not to do it. Adamberger, furious at Rosenberg and overcome by pride at the absolutely wrong time, did not know how to properly revenge himself, but said stupidly, all right then, to prove that Adamberger had already made his reputation in Vienna and doesn't need to make a name for himself through music that was specially written for him. And he will indeed just sing what's in the opera and never again introduce a new aria. He concludes this letter by saying the worst part of it is that his wife's and my own prediction came true, namely that Count Rosenberg and the management here knew nothing about it. It had all been a trick by Salieri. Oh. Okay, well, then conductors are always the same. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know what? Towards the end, I mean, he went to a performance of the Magic Flute, Salieri did, and apparently clapped all the way through it and absolutely loved it. Right. So. Well, I think, uh, yeah, contrary to, to, to legend, I think Salieri was very positive about Mozart, and they were probably quite respectful of each other as, as colleagues, were they not? I, I think so. Yes. Right. right. Yeah. Well, and then so then it's not really Salieri who who um, tricked Mozart at the end into writing his requiem. No, Mozart was very ill by that time, and this hooded figure, which is true, came and requested a requiem, and it turns out that it was some count 
who had a habit of doing this, of going to composers, getting them to write music, and then he'd pass it off as his own. But as you know, Mozart was so ill, and he couldn't finish it. So he asked his pupil, Sussmeyer, if he would complete the Requiem, which he did. And I think, I believe you had told me that Sussmeyer completed something else of his, he too. Also, yeah, he also completed the uh, D minor fantasy. Uh, he was he, one of Mozart's uh, star compositional students. But his claim really is his very graceful uh, uh, dealings with what Mozart left unwritten. Uh, the Requiem, of course, is the big example where he completed a lot. Mozart left some very minimal sketches uh, in a lot of the Requiem, but enough for someone like Suess Meyer, who understood both Mozart and music, to to finish incredibly tastefully. Uh, I think most of us agree. Um, and he never really took it beyond where it needed to go. He he just got the ideas out so that they could could be enjoyed as Mozart's and it was just sort of a, a tidy here's what here's what Mozart had to say. Well it's so interesting about the Requiem because both at Beethoven's funeral I believe also at Chopin's, and Chopin's funeral as well. The, that was the piece of music that was chosen and I have a, a quote that um, I would like to end with and this again comes from Jan Swaf uh, Swafford, and he says, If Beethoven teaches us the power of revolutionary vitality and individually, individuality under disciplined control, and Bach reveals the full scope of human creative potential, then Mozart stands as the embodiment of the possibility of perfection. One other quote that I wanted to share in closing, too, is from Kierkegaard. Um, and this is from his work, Either Or. And Kierkegaard says, What is a poet? A poet, by which he meant both himself and Mozart, is an unhappy being whose heart is torn by secret sufferings, but whose lips are so strangely formed that when the sighs and cries escape them, they sound like beautiful music. And men crowd about that poet and say to him, Sing for us soon again. That is as much to say, May new sufferings torment your soul. So a very interesting journey for that, uh, that incredible uh, young talent, Mozart, who did not live very long, but uh, in his short 35 years made, uh, made an absolutely amazing contribution to, uh, to music. And I, I, the, one of the things that, that I'll close with that I found so interesting is that he composed almost entirely in his head, in the sense that he heard the complete melodies in his head and then wrote them down very quickly, which uh, to me is absolutely amazing, like, and, and made very few changes. Like, that's incredible. It is incredible. It's really like divine dictation. <laughs> well, that's an, a lovely way to describe well, it. Well, what a what a conduit from from that holy place to to our humanity, Barb. It's been just great as always having you here for these uh, for these podcasts, and I want to uh, thank you very very much for for just diving into it as you always do, and and for all your 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 joy uh, and uh, search for all all these fun nuggets of, of fascinating facts. <laughs> I have a lot of fun and I enjoy it so much. And I just enjoy the conversation with you about these artists. Well, thank you, Barb. It sure is great fun. If anyone has anything they would like to contribute to the conversation, we'd love to hear from you. Drop us an email at westben at westben.ca and we'll continue the conversation. Barb, we'll see you next time. Thanks a million. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to Music for a While. 
This podcast is created with Anchor and is sponsored by our friends Finley and Associates as well as the Windswept Group. There are many ways to stay up to date with all things West Bend. Make your way to www.westbend.ca where you will find the entirety of the Sunshine Ahead campaign and have the option to join our e-newsletter. You can also follow us on social, at West Bend on Instagram, at West Bend Center on Twitter, and at West Bend Concerts on Facebook. Thank you again for listening.